So today, I want to do week three of a series that I entitled Ears to Hear. Now, two weeks ago, I started this series and I spoke on the subject of the deafening silence of God. And in that message, I made many comparisons between our relationship with our spouse and our relationship with God. You remember the text? The text was Psalm chapter 13, verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And we read on through uh, that psalm. And last week, I did part two on discerning the voices of God. And if you missed it, you need to get that. It's on Facebook and YouTube today at 11 o'clock. You, you, you watch that because it's important. And in that message, though I used many uh, scriptures in my teaching, we talked about the fact that you and I are created with an ability to, to communicate with God. We talked about as a believer, you've already heard from God. We talked about the fact that you must be careful not to limit God to our methods of communication. In other words, you're not limited to verbal. We talked about the fact that we all go through seasons where we don't seem to be able to discern the voice of God or what God is saying to us. We talked about the fact that obedience cannot be limited to our understanding that we're only going to do what we're told to do. Then lastly, uh, we talked about the fact that God speaks continually. We're just not always in a position to hear continually. So today I want to talk on the subject, do you have ears to hear the voice? Now, any marriage counselor will tell you the most important factor of any marriage is communication. Your spouse may have lost their mind but if you can talk through it, it can be resolved. If you can communicate through it, it can usually be resolved. And this is also very similar to our relationship with God. We have an important factor in our relationship, and that is communication. Our communication to Him is prayer. And his communication to us is various ways that he speaks to us. But I ask you the question, what is God speaking to you? Is God willing to speak with you? Is, is he willing as, to speak to everyone here? And I say to you, the answer to that is absolutely yes. God wants to communicate with you as much as he wants you to communicate with him. In the Gospels, Jesus said repeatedly, He who has ears, let him hear. In Revelation, in speaking to the church, in chapter 2, verse 29, uh, Jesus says, Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, I don't believe that Jesus was referring to ears of the flesh, but rather ears of the Spirit. Spirit ears hear spirit things. You might want to write that down. If you didn't get a copy of the handout, there's handouts on the back back there, a place for you to take your notes. But spirit ears hear spirit things. And that's the subject I want to approach today. Now we all know that Jesus taught in parables. And in, in, he was 
teaching these parables to large crowds. These parables were thought-provoking. They were multi-level. They were deep-dimensional. Uh, they, 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 they spoke to different people about different things at different times. And they were spoken to large crowds where everybody could hear. But the meanings of the parables were only perceived or heard by some of them. It's one thing to preach the word or to sit under the preaching. It's another word to absorb it. And that's what the people were dealing with of that day and the people are still dealing with today. The Spirit is speaking, but not everybody is absorbing. So this, this, this habit of, of preaching uh, from parables got to be a little confusing for the disciples. And so they just point blank ask, you know, those disciples, I'm here to tell you, some of them had the tact of a meat cleaver. So in Matthew chapter 13, verse 10, it says this, The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to people in parables? And he replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not them. They were in the same room. They were hearing the same message. Some were getting the, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven and some weren't. The secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not them. The passage goes on. It says, whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I'm speaking to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. I like the way the Amplified says that. It says it this way. This is the reason I speak to the crowds in parables, because while having the power of seeing they do not see and having the power of hearing they do not hear watch this nor do they understand and grasp spiritual things they weren't getting it the reason they weren't getting it is because they didn't have the power to understand and grasp spiritual things so all in the same room, all in the same church, but some of them were getting it and some of them weren't. Now it should be noted that that was part of the justification that they used to crucify Jesus. Their misperception of one of the parables. Jesus told them, Tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. So when he was standing before the Sanhedrin and accused of blasphemy, this is the accusation they brought to him. He said he'd tear down the temple and he'd rebuild it in three days. One, he couldn't tear it down. Second, he couldn't build it in three days. The thing was, in this parable style teaching, he wasn't talking about the physical temple, he was talking about the body as a temple, and they didn't get it. And they used it against him. They picked his sermon apart, and they used it to crucify him. Now, I've been in some churches that did the same thing. Fortunately, I'm not in one of those today. So, his parables, his teaching, his voice was heard by thousands. Thousands of ears that could physically hear, but they couldn't understand and they couldn't absorb what was being said. 
You remember the sermon, eat my flesh and drink my blood? And the mass exodus that took place that day? All, I mean, you talk about split a church. That was an unpopular message. Eat my flesh and drink my blood? No, I'm out. Because they did not understand what he was teaching. They did not have ears to hear the parable that was teaching. And everybody forsook him except for the disciples. And he looks at them and says, You're not going to leave me too? You have the words of life. We've got nowhere to go. So... What was offensive, a message that was offensive to some, there were 12 there, they got it. These are words of life. Offense on one side, life on the other, and it was in the same sermon. Because the 12 had ears to hear. So, I want to look at the ways to hear God's voice. But first, we need to ask ourselves, what kept the crowds from hearing and absorbing what Jesus was teaching? You say, well, because they didn't have ears to hear. Who lacked ears to hear? What's the characteristics of someone who lacks ears to hear? Who was it that was missing the parables? The first one I would like to suggest to you are those who lacked faith to hear and understand. They lacked faith. They had what the church is dealing with today. It's called carnality. I know you want to shout me down now. You see, you cannot explain spiritual concepts to unspiritual people. So when Jesus is teaching a spiritual parable and the, to unspiritual people, the unspiritual people didn't get it, the spiritual ones did. Those that were living a carnal life missed it such as the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees were religious. They went through the motions of worship, but they were still unspiritual. So they didn't have ears to hear. They were carnal. But, I, you know, it's easy to point the fingers at the Pharisees. How dare you do that? But I say to you that Phariseeism is alive and well in the churches today. That there are people uh, in every church that have a carnal mindset. They're unspiritual. They go through the motions of religiosity. They come in, they walk through the door, they hug a few necks, they sing a few songs, they listen to a message, and then they go and live their life like they want. And the message never seems to resonate with them. It never seems to change them. It is as if that message is wasted on them. You say, well, is it a waste? No. They're given another opportunity. They just didn't take it. There are also people in today's church, they're learning word but lack relationship. Like this is a textbook. You know, I can go over here to UWF, I can take a class, they're going, uh, they're going to tell me which book they're going to be teaching out of. I've got to go to the bookstore, buy the book. And if I'm going to retain what they're teaching, I need to absorb what's in the book. I need to absorb the lecture if you will, in order for me to retain what they're trying to teach me. But that's a secular mindset. You can be trained 
what the scriptures say and never walk in it. You can learn word, you can quote this Bible from front to back, but unless you let it change your life, then you just, it's just Phariseeism. Then there's the group that knows truth but chooses to live a lie. What a terrible thing to sit under the teaching of the Word week after week, month after month. Know that this is the way. It's resonated with you enough that you know this is the way. You're convicted by what you do, but yet you live contrary to what you believe. They live a lie. Well, I'm under grace. I'm not under law, I'm under grace. It's like grace is a license for immorality. That's not tr- what grace is. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says this. It says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but rather as people who are still worldly. King James says, people who are carnal mere infants in Christ. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying, I can't teach you what I need to teach you because you're not receiving, you're not receiving because you're carnal. Carnality will keep you from receiving what the Spirit has for you. Paul had just said in the chapter before, said the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned, discerned, absorbed, only through the Spirit. A person without the Spirit cannot accept the things that come from the Spirit cannot hear the voice coming from the Spirit, but considers what the Spirit says as foolishness, and they can't understand what the Spirit is saying to them because they don't have the discernment in their spirit. Why? Because they're carnal. Because they're carnal. Secondly, Those who have hardened their hearts cannot hear what the Spirit is saying to them. They lack the willingness to hear. You know, when we were kids and people would say things you don't want to hear, you'd put your finger in you and go, la, 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 la. Remember that? For some people, that's a lifestyle. The Spirit's saying this to them, and they're la, 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 I don't want to hear it. They have an unwillingness. They've hardened their heart to what the Spirit is saying. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15 says, as, it, as has just been said today, if you hear his voice, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Why? Because if you hear the voice and you harden your heart, you will not do what he's telling you to do. Hardness of heart will keep you from hearing what God is saying to you. You, you, I'm sure everybody has had a sponge at their house. Now, Penny and I, we kind of like our sponges. You know, we're, we're, we're a little weird, okay? So I don't go to Walmart and buy one of them dollar sponges. I want to go to, um, I want to go to this Greek village just north of Tampa. It's a sponge dock, and the the fishermen go out and they take the boats out and then they cut the sponges and then they bring them back and they dry them out and they sell them on the dock. 
real live breathing sponges that are dried out. They're great sponges, and they're like six bucks. You know, you go to the store, they're like 30, all right? But I love those cool sponges. They even look cool. They hold your soap. But you know what? Until you take that sponge and put it in water, it's hard as rock. And it's, if it's hard as rock, it's worthless. If a sponge is hard as rock, it's worthless. And the same thing is true with your heart. If you've hardened your heart like the crust on a sponge, guess what? You're not going to enjoy the freedom of the sponge. Before I put the soap on my sponge in my... Uh, Y'all, I got one of those showers, okay? Ignacio went over and he built me one of these showers. All right? Every time I step in the shower, I feel like I'm on vacation, all right? It, it, it's one of those that's out of, out of a magazine kind of thing. I mean, it's cool. And then you, you, you turn on the waterfall, okay? It sprinkles down like rain. You take your sponge, you put it under there, it wets your sponge, put some soap on it. Yeah, I'm telling you, I'm like, a, I'm like a little baby sitting in a sink getting a bath, okay? I love my sponges, but if I don't put it under the water... I can't use it because it'll be like sandpaper. It won't do what I need it to do. And the same is true with your heart. If you don't have the moisture of the Spirit to wet your heart, it will not absorb what the Spirit is saying to it. So, thirdly, there are those who are too aloof, they're too wise in their own eyes, those who lack humility, those who have arrogance and they have pride in their life. I don't need God. I don't need God to say anything to me. I love what Jesus said in the book of Luke. Chapter 10, verse 21, he says, At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, the Lord of heaven and earth, because you have what? Hidden these things from the wise and learned. The smart people of the world. The proud, the arrogant, the boastful, the ones that live on the right side of the tracks, the ones that are highly educated. Do, you see what I'm saying? And I'm not against all of those, any of those things. Don't misunderstand me. But they can't take the place of God. Scripture goes on, he says, You've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, this is what you were pleased to do. That's what he did in those parables. He hid it from the wise and learned. The meanings were hidden from the wise and the learned. And the ones that went in like sponges, the little children, so impressionable, so innocent, those are the ones that received what the Spirit was saying. You see, sophistication can be a dangerous thing. I'm too sophisticated to go to that church. Sophistication has a tendency to separate you, to separate the common from the uncommon. To, to create a class of people, the sophisticated and the not sophisticated. Let me tell you something. If you are too sophisticated for God, you are too sophisticated. Sophistication can be a dangerous thing. Secondly, wealth is a dangerous thing. I don't need God. I got everything else I want. There are people that walk 
on every street dealing with that. I'm rich and have need of nothing. They're too rich to even want, to have even an appetite, even a desire to hear what God is saying. Let me tell you something. If your money comes between you and God, I hope God takes every dime of it. And I've seen him do it before, too. I've seen him take an individual's entire life worth to get them back to ground zero where they would at least turn their heart to God and then he would start reassembling their life. If you have too much wealth to believe for God, then you have too much wealth. Thirdly, not only is sophistication dangerous and wealth is dangerous, pride is what got Satan ejected from heaven. Pride is a dangerous thing. I was talking with a friend yesterday. Uh, uh, one of my dearest friends who uh, really took me under his wing after I got saved. Um, uh, he and I, we spent the afternoon together yesterday. And uh, we were talking about uh, this individual in ministry and that individual in ministry. And, um, you know, he said, you know, what happened there? I said, uh, well, the truth of the matter is it wasn't scandal. It wasn't, uh, you know, lack of skills. It was pride. Pride destroyed their ministry. And I had to say that for like two or three times different people that we were discussing. They began to believe their own press. Let me tell you something. Uh, there are a lot of leaders out there today. They surround themselves by people who tell them what they want to hear. Okay? Just, I don't, I don't want to hear what I, uh, I don't want to hear the truth. Just tell me what I want to hear. Let somebody else deal with the truth. Tell me how great I am. Tell me how wonderful a leader I am. Tell me how beautiful I look. I don't want truth. That's the same thing that Satan says to God. I'm not interested in your truth. I'm interested in your seat. And God said, I don't think so. And ejected him out of heaven. And you know that I was reading this the other day in my studies. When all is said and done, and mankind is standing there and they're looking at Satan, they're going to look at him, they're going to scratch their heads, they're going to look at him and say, is this guy the one that troubled the nations? He must be a punk. He must be uglier than I am. He ain't, when you look at him, he ain't going to look like much. Otherwise, you wouldn't say that about him. Is this the man that troubled the nations? You've got to be kidding me. I'm not trying to slander created beings. I'm just telling you that's what the scripture says. Pride got Satan ejected from heaven and pride will separate you from your need for God when you become self-made. When you become great in your own eyes, there are people that are that way, that spend their life that way going through life with blinders on. I'd much rather somebody just tell me the truth than to lie to me and tell me what I want to hear. I've always been very careful as a leader to surround myself with people that will tell the truth. You said, well, that may hinder you know, how your department looks. That may hinder how you look on the job. That may... Uh, hinder your name, your reputation. Well, I would still have somebody, rather have somebody to tell me the truth than to tell me a lie. Because if they tell you a lie to your face, they'll also lie behind your back. 
If I can't trust you to tell me the truth to my face, I can't trust you when I turn my back. Bless neither here or there. Those that are too aloof, wise in their own eyes, tend not to hear what God is saying to them. And then lastly, those who have unconfessed sin in their lives, whether it be unconfessed acts of the body or thoughts of the mind, have a tendency to not hear from God. You say, what does a sinner hear from God? They hear conviction, and that's it. You need to get right with God. You've got sin in your life. And let me tell you something. If you've got unconfessed sin in your life, you'll miss the voice of God. You'll miss what God is saying to you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Don't live like the world lives in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, understanding being the voice of God. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God. So the voice of God and the life of God, they have separation because of the ignorance that is in them. It says they are darkened in their understanding. They cannot perceive. They cannot receive. Why? Because they got sin in their life. They're living a life of ignorance. So this morning I have to ask you a question. Do you have unconfessed sin in your life? You say, Pastor, I'm not comfortable with this kind of message. I don't care. I'm here to challenge you and question you. Do you have unconfessed sin in your life? Because unconfessed sin the only thing you're going to hear is conviction. Conviction, you need to get right with God. You need to get right with God. You need to get right with God. You're never going to walk in your purpose if you're not right with God. It doesn't pay, take a PhD in theology to figure that one out. Unconfessed sin will keep you from hearing and the, uh, sub subsequently walking in what God has for you. So do you have ears to hear? And if you don't, is it because of these factors I listed today? Pride. Pride is a big one. Carnality. Unconfessed sin. All of these will keep you from hearing what God is trying to say to you. Bow your heads with me, please. Father, now, whether they're in this room or they're watching by video, I ask the question, point blank, do you have sin in your life? Do you have sin in your life? Because sin will keep you from being able to hear the voice of God. Sin will cause you to miss everything that God is trying to do in your life. You say, well, I've gotten to a place, I've, made, I've got this sin in my life, but God understands that's how I'm made. No, I don't think so. Unconfessed sin cannot be ignored. So now, Father, I'm asking right now for everyone within the sound of my voice to examine their heart 
and ask the question. Do I have sin in my 